Trump drooled in the middle of his mindless fugue state rant at Savannah, Georgia yesterday, and then a scant 45 minutes later, he revealed he had just found out that Russia was on our side against Hitler in World War II. These are not metaphors. This is tough to convey audio only, but listen carefully. It's quick. I'll play it three times. You can hear him. He dribbles on himself and says, forced to be out. You'll hear it sounds like forced. That's the drool. He wipes it away with his left forefinger between out and because. Stand by for the Republican candidate for dementia in chief, drooling on himself. Want to be, but they were forced to be out because in this country. But they were forced to be out because in this country. But they were forced to be out because. You know how old he is? He's 206. Trump was sweating like a stevedore during the last half hour of the last debate, repeatedly having to, as the baseball guys say, go to his mouth to wipe the perspiration off his upper lip. And now, live from Savannah, it's Dribble Cup night. Did you see that on the news last night? Even on cable? If that had happened to President Biden two months ago, they would have played that on a loop for, well, the show would not yet be over, would it? On CNN. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. Back and to the left, right there. There's the drool. In point of fact, CNN described this drool speech as Trump focuses on economy at stop in Battleground, Georgia. And then, somehow, Trump's hallucinations got worse. We will not leave until we win. What happens if they win? That's what they do is they fight wars. As somebody told me the other day, they beat Hitler, they beat Napoleon. That's what they do. They fight. Somebody just told me, hey, did you hear the news? Napoleon got the crap beaten out of him at Borodino, like like 40,000 casualties, like 50 dead generals. I didn't know Napoleon had 50 generals. Yeah, I just saw it on channel 19th century. Somebody just told me Russia beat Hitler. Good God, wherever Trump's mind has gone to, it has caused him to reveal he has no sense of world history, even things that happened during his lifetime. No more sense of it than the director Roger Debris in the Mel Brooks movie The Producers. I never knew the Third Reich meant Germany. I mean, the play is drenched with historical goodies like that. I appreciate that every two weeks or so, I take up some of your increasingly valuable time and I say, look, his brain is so loosely attached to reality, it is going to have to fall out soon. But maybe it's not. Maybe he has kind of lucid stretches where he's just evil. And then these really crazy stretches where he's evil and stupid and drooling. And he not only thinks Jimmy Kimmel hosts The Tonight Show, but that it's time for Jimmy to go and it's time to bring back, well, it's time to say, here's Johnny. I went on his show, right? And he goes, The Tonight Show, which is dying. They're all dying. Where's Johnny Carson? Bring back Johnny. It made you appreciate, right, Uncle Seth? I know Johnny Carson used to take a lot of time off towards the end of his Tonight Show. But that's not what this absence is. What this absence is, is he's dead. That's what this absence is. Since 2005. Johnny isn't here? Uh, Johnny is here. Johnny isn't here. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the substantial things yet. Like this stalker language he used towards women in a speech two nights ago about how he'll be their protector and they'll never have to worry again, and they'll never think about abortions. And I'm listening to Trump, and I'm thinking, is he quoting Sean Diddy Combs, or was Sean Diddy Combs quoting him? And we still haven't even gotten to the madness of the immigrant story. He's still on the Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, and his plans to send them back to Venezuela because he apparently legitimately thinks that's where Haiti is. 
Haiti is in Venezuela, in the Trump world, where he just found out that the Russians beat Napoleon in one century and helped us beat Hitler in the other. Haiti, or as J.B. Vance calls it, Haitia. And no, Trump did not actually call for tattooing all immigrants from Haitia and others places with serial numbers like, you know, the Nazi death camps. He didn't do that, not because he'd never do something like that, but because he already thinks they have serial numbers. I mean, this was the exact quote. We're getting the criminals out and we're going to do that fast and we know who they are and the local police know their names and they know their serial numbers. They know everything about them, unquote. If this guy's just finding out about Napoleon losing at Borodino in 1812, I'm thinking it's a fair assumption that he doesn't know that they don't have serial numbers right now. Just like he doesn't know that you don't have to produce an ID card to buy a sandwich at the grocery store. And when he does find out that they don't have serial numbers, he will go the Holocaust route with them or maybe go right to barcodes. The good news here is a group called Haitian Bridge Alliance in Springfield, Ohio, has filed suit in Clark County Municipal Court demanding that the local district attorney file criminal charges against Trump and Vance for lying about the Haitian immigrants, for lying about their legal status here, for lying about their positive impact on that city. And this is not, God bless them, just a somebody do something thing. Quote, like those who falsely shout fire in a crowded theater, Trump and Vance do not color within the lines of the First Amendment. They commit criminal acts. You're goddamned right they do. This complaint demands prosecutions for seven specific charges covering five specific criminal offenses in the city and state codes, disrupting public services, making false alarms, aggravated menacing, complicity, and telecommunications harassment. It is a brilliant and necessary action, and every group threatened by Trump and his monkey-wearing eyeliner Vance should file similar motions in every jurisdiction in this country into which Trump has drooled his drool of regret and his venom of remorse. For Vance in particular, this is going to create an impossible situation if he and Trump lose, which I presume Vance has not for one moment actually contemplated. He took office, already hated by nearly half his constituents. He has induced so many bomb threats now in Springfield, Ohio. I am surprised his phone has not been seized by the police. Now, imagine him the subject of a series of forced prosecutions by pro-Haitian groups around the state of Ohio. I'm the character witness for the Haitian group. Who are you? I'm the Republican mayor of Springfield, Ohio. It is Vance, of course, who continues to insist that the Haitians legally in Ohio are not there legally. And even worse, to say that their legal status is, in fact, fluid, that it can be withdrawn at his and Trump's instruction. The Pandora's box this opens is astonishing because if allowed to happen, it could be a gateway to the revocation of citizenship for people who were born here, but whose parents were not born here. You know, like Melania Trump. Or you could deport any naturalized citizen, you know, like Elon Musk. Okay, let me rethink this for a moment. I'm beginning to sense that maybe under responsible control. This, this idea could be, you know, revoked citizenship. That could be really useful. So, so, sir, you were born here and your father was born here, but his father was born in Germany. And, and what does it say here? Your mother was born in Scotland? What part of America is Scotland, sir? I'm afraid, sir, under the new naturalization process, you are now considered an anchor baby. And looking at you, I can see the emphasis here is on baby. And your citizenship is revoked, Mr. Trump. Here's your ticket back to Venezuela. You 
want to go to the change the rules in the middle of the game game? Let's play that game. Let's play that goddamn game. Let's find out where your grandparents are from. Where was your mother born? You're out. Just for like 33 people in this country, starting with Trump and Musk and Melania. Rather astonishingly, between the drooling and the more commonplace world history, you should never, never, ever admit you didn't know until recently, like who beat Hitler and Napoleon. Trump has also made what I think is the first overt threat to imprison political critics. He's still going kind of sideways on this, but it's there. They were very brave, the Supreme Court, very brave, and they take a lot of hits because of it. It should be illegal what happens. You know, you have these guys uh, like playing the ref, like the great Bobby Knight. These people are, should be put in jail the way they talk about our judges and our justices. Ironically, the first guy who would go to prison for criticizing judges would be Trump. Ask Judge Chutkin and Judge Mershon and Judge Kaplan and Judge Curiel from the Trump College of Con Man Knowledge case and all the other judges. It's funny, isn't it, that he's still more enraged against Mershon than against Chutkin because Chutkin just sent more shutters through Trump's camp and encouraged more anticipatory drooling. Sorry. In law abiding America, the backup scenario for when the corrupt Supreme Theocratic Court urinated on the Constitution to give Trump just enough immunity to delay his trials until after the election, the backup plan for that event will be engaged. In the next 24, 36 hours, not only will much of special counsel Jack Smith's evidence against Trump in the election subversion case be revealed publicly, but it will be revealed supersized. Over the weekend, Smith advised the judge that his opening brief would in fact be an opening not so brief. And rather than the customary 35, 40, 50 pages, it might be 200. Looks like the actual number of pages will be 180 pages. Please, no wagering. Trump's attorneys, this month's Trump's attorneys, immediately filed a motion to suppress or delay or refuse or hold their breath. And as usual, Chutkin not only denied them, she denied them, then slapped them and told them you'll get nothing and you'll like it. She writes in her ruling, allowing a brief from the government is not, quote, contrary to law, procedure and custom, as defendant claims. It is simply how litigation works, unquote. She left out the two additional words, you assholes, because, well, we all know she meant them. So why did she have to bother and write them down? The filing deadline for Jack Smith is tomorrow, so it could be filed today. They, for custom, probably will wait till tomorrow. Whichever, it will go into the courtlistener.com documents harvester and then stand well back because all oh, hell's going to break loose. Remember, this will be the amended Smith filing against Trump for, you know, trying to encourage others to break every law we have and violently overthrow the government elect of this nation. Minus all those things that Smith believes the Supreme Court intends to let Trump get away with via its phony baloney immunity ruling. Well, I have you a couple of poll numbers. Bullfinch poll with some amazing states. This is after the Mark Robinson scandal, North Carolina Harris by two. They also have her Georgia by two. And in Florida, they have Trump by one. One. And Senator Rick Scott by two. These are registered voters, though. Likely voters would probably be a little looser. Poll closed September 23rd. Nationally, Quinnipiac tied at 48. A month ago, Quinnipiac was Harris by one, so no change. Nationally, CNN, Harris 48, Trump 47. Nationally, Ipsos for Reuters, Harris 50, Trump 44. And again, the variations are all based on one thing. Those last three numbers are likely voters. Are you a likely voter? Yes. I don't think you are. Okay, then I'm not on your poll. You bet you're not. Inside the CNN polling, a bunch of favorability numbers. In January, Harris was underwater by 20 points. She is now underwater by just four. Trump was under by 19 points in January. He is now underwater by 12. 
Vance, who, when only one quarter of this nation knew who the hell he was in June, was underwater by seven points, is now known by three quarters of the country and is now underwater by 12 points. Gurgle, gurgle. Alone in the CNN poll, Tim Walls. Apparently, we like Tim Walls. 36 to 32. It appears Trump is being hacked again. Judd Legum at Popular Information says somebody named Robert sent his organization, Trump Campaign Info, on the 15th. He's not publishing it. This isn't the Post or the Times or the others who tend to turn the gravity on and off journalistically whenever they feel like it. Judd has chops. I'm not sure I agree with him, but at least he went into detail about why he has done what he has done and... He has explained what the others have not. He has characterized what the leaks talk about. I'll quote him. I believe that in some circumstances, the publication of leaked materials can be justified. The Pentagon Papers, for example, were obtained illegally by Daniel Ellsberg, but the public interest in revealing the truth about the Vietnam War outweighed those concerns. The internal Trump campaign documents obtained by popular information may be embarrassing or problematic to members of the Trump campaign. Some of the documents have news value, but the stolen materials do not provide the public with any fundamental new insight about Trump or his campaign. So on balance, the relevant factors argue against publication. What I suspect will happen will be that eventually Robert or whoever is behind this, Iranians, Mike Pence, people who like their presidential candidates to know about Hitler and Napoleon and Russia, Battle of Borodino, whoever is responsible sometime just before the election will find a news organization or a semi-news organization that will print stuff right before the election. So all of this hemming and hawing and deep, anguished sometimes analysis by people like Judd Legum will go to naught because they'll send the stuff to OK Magazine and they'll publish it. I'm in favor of that, if only to even up the score for 2016. And then we pass a law or something. Doesn't look like there's anything in these newest leaks about any of the latest quartet of amazing examples of every fascist accusation is actually a confession stories. My God, The Guardian reports that Kevin Roberts, literally the auteur of Project 2025, while the Republicans are insisting immigrants are eating your pets, Kevin Roberts is revealed to allegedly have done a Christy Gnome before Christy Gnome was uncool. Killed a dog, the neighbor's dog, with a shovel for barking. Quoting, he told university colleagues about two decades ago that he had killed a neighborhood dog with a shovel because it was barking and disturbing his family, according to former colleagues who spoke to The Guardian. Quote, my recollection of his account was that he was discussing in the hallway with various members of the faculty, including me, that a neighbor's dog had been barking pretty relentlessly and was, you know, keeping the baby and probably the parents awake and that he kind of lost it and took a shovel and killed the dog. End of problem said Kenneth Hammond, who was the chair of the university's history department at the time. Two other people, a professor and her spouse, recall hearing a similar account directly from Roberts at a dinner at his home. Three other professors also said they heard the account at that time from the colleagues who said they had heard it directly from Roberts. None recall Roberts who worked at that university as an assistant professor from 2003 to 2005, ever saying that the dog he allegedly said he killed was actively threatening him or his family. In a statement to The Guardian, Roberts denied ever killing a dog with a shovel, end quote. You guys at The Guardian ask him if he ever killed a dog without a shovel? Did he then say no comment? One quote here. Where is it again? Keeping the parents awake and that he kind of lost it and took a shovel and killed the democracy. Oh, no, dog, not democracy. As to would-be Ohio Senator Bernie Moreno, no, it's not misogyny and ageism that made him claim that women should not be one-issue abortion voters, especially those over 50. 
implying that women over 50 would never need an abortion, so why would they care? I mean, there is misogyny and ageism, but mostly this is just Bernie Moreno is a moron, another nitwit, the kind who does not know that women over 50 have daughters who might want the right to control their own bodies, or even if they don't have daughters, they might just want, you know, lawful rights for other citizens. Vote Republican, elect another moron to the Senate. Look, you can't spell moron without Moreno. There it is. M-O-R-E-N-O. The Texas Observer reports that the human donut Trump henchman Jason Miller had his email appear in the same data breach that contributed to Mark Robinson's week from hell. It's the same email Miller was connected to in court documents, the Texas Observer says. New York fascist Congressman Anthony Desposito, one of his party's moderates, wins the double play award. The New York Times reports the ex-New York City cop, and by the way, everybody who is not an ex-New York City cop appears to be an ex-New York City staffer for Mayor Eric Adams. They're dropping like flies. Desposito hired his fiancé's daughter as a part-time paid employee in his congressional district office right after he assumed that job. Then last April, that's April 2023, he hired somebody else as another part-time paid employee in the same office. His mistress, surprisingly enough, this is not only a violation of ethics rules, but it's also of how dumb is this mook rules because it led to the fiance finding out about the mistress. And if you think Congressman Desposito is pathetic, the fiance then took him back. And lastly, this bulletin comic relief. There's the new British Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer. I like him. But at his first Labor Party conference as prime minister, he proved that Trump isn't the only one who needs significant remedial prompter work. I am very good at teaching the reading of teleprompters. I can get them up to speed with like three or four half an hour sessions. Just fly me to London. I'll get right to work. The line at the party conference was, I call again for immediate ceasefire in Gaza, the return of the hostages, only he didn't say hostages. I call again for immediate ceasefire in Gaza, the return of the hostages, the hostages. It sounds better with an English accent, but yeah, you heard it. He still said, return of the sausages. Return of the sausages, hostages, the hostage sausages. Let's everybody break for lunch. And Starmer was in Egypt's land. Let my sausages go. Also of interest here in an all new edition. It's the funniest thing I have ever seen. And yes, it's about me. And the other thing, somewhat related to it, is the dumbest thing I have ever seen. And it's about why journalists should, should sleep with their sausages. Oh, no, sources. Why they should sleep with their sources. And it's from the former media reporter of the New York goddamn Holy Times. And he's also the co-founder of Semaphore News. And honestly, he should never be allowed to work again in the sausage making business of news in his life. Oh, all this talk of sausages and I'm drooling. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. us on this all new edition of countdown next in things i promise not to tell they were the second most important hockey team in ithaca new york 
They had ex-Cornell standouts on them. They played teams like the Montreal Canadiens old-timers, the Ancien Pro. They used to fill, or nearly fill, Cornell's famous rink. They had Cornell Hall of Famer Bill Duffy on their team. And the greatest name in hockey history played for them, winger Murray Death. Though he was beginning to change the pronunciation to Deeth. Good call. And then they did something to me, to my radio station, to my sports department, to my aspirations that caused me at the age of 19 to go on the air and flat out lie and say they had gone out of business. The saga of the Ithaca stars. Rest in peace. Next in an all new things I promise not to tell. First, there are still more new idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, the worst, Abby Phillip, CNN's 10 p.m. anchor. I bet you didn't know that. The CNN anchor doing the absolute best impressions of both Maggie Haberman and Chuck Todd and occasionally Chris Saliza. After parroting the Trump fascist talking point that Kamala Harris has somehow been in charge of the southern border and the Republican complaint that she hasn't gone to the southern border and done a performative political photo op just like all the Republicans do and all the nitwits at CNN can just barely process because it does fit into one of the very few story templates they can begin to understand and it involves sane washing. After all of that, Abby Phillip is now complaining that Vice President Harris is going to the border. First, Phillip said there was polling that said Trump would be better on the issue, unquote, because shoving immigrants and their supporters into concentration camps where, guess what, genius, some of them are going to die, is much better than the compromise that Harris supported and Biden arranged and Trump vetoed for campaign reasons. Philip, after that, nitwittedly added that Harris is, quote, hoping to change the narrative that she's soft on immigration. One of the things about this moment, I mean, the Harris campaign has just been trying to float above it all, to float above the immigration arguments, float above some of the nitty gritty details on some of this policy. But this shows that they realize they have to do something. Well, if anybody in this country is going to know about floating above it all, it would be a CNN anchor especially the lowest rated host in cable news prime time. Thursday, barely half of Lawrence O'Donnell's audience, one quarter of Greg Gutfield's audience. My God, how could you show up to work the next day? Hey, how are the ratings? Uh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Friday? Friday, Abby Phillip had an average of 86,000 viewers under the age of 55. For reference... And it's apples to oranges. I know my number has nothing to do with under 55. It's a total. But on Friday, this podcast, between its online audience and its YouTube audience, this thing had 116,221 viewers and listeners. Can't imagine why she's in last place. Floating above it all. The runner-up worser, Mike Lindell, the guy who has smoked too many pillows. His latest attempt to offset his $11 billion debt that has been driven up insisting Trump didn't lose the election he lost? Lindell is now selling pillows at steep discounts. Your cost, $14.88. $14.88. $14.88. What an odd price. Lots of people sell things that say $14.98 or $14.99, but $0.88? Well, you know what $14.88 means, right? 1488 on the white supremacist far right the murderers 1488 is one of the more common signals from one of the scumbags to another of the scumbags meaning hey i'm a fellow scumbag let's go knife somebody why 1488 the price of the lindell pillow 14 means the 14 words as in quote we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children Knowing how dumb these people are, I did check. It is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, 14 words. They got it right. 88. Well, those are the numbers closest to the letters HH, as in, quote, Heil Hitler, unquote. Mike Lindell says this is all ridiculous and it's just a coincidence. And why would he know about white supremacists? 
But our winner, how in the world has Mike Lindell avoided accidentally killing himself all this time? Is that the greatest streak in human history? I mean, he makes Keith Richards look like some sort of stay-at-home, get-to-bed-at-6.30pm dilettante who only drinks tea. But our winner, Ben Smith, editor and co-founder of Semaphore Media. Now, I said I didn't have much more to say about Olivia Newsy and that she lived with me, but I did want to mention some other things, mostly throwaways about her, even good jokes about her. But I only saw this the other day. What Ben Smith wrote about this is the most amazingly tone-deaf thing. Doesn't have anything to do with me. It's the most amazingly tone-deaf thing I've read about her, or even about RFK Jr., or maybe about anything in the history of news reporting. I'll get to it in a second. First, the actual newsy news oozy updates. Uh, This is from CNN's Brian Stelter. Are other outlets reviewing the work of Olivia Newsy in the wake of her relationship with Kennedy Jr.? They aren't saying. Bloomberg is not commenting on questions surrounding Newsy, who recently hosted the series Working Capital at the outlet, where she interviewed prominent political leaders. Uh Uh-oh. Separately, AMC Networks, which had commissioned a satirical drama that Newsy was set to executive produce, is remaining mum on her involvement in the project. As an aside, and this would be true of anybody, not just that it's her, I'm just sort of liberated to talk about her now, how could a satirical drama that Newsy was set to executive produce possibly rival, for sheer quality, the satirical drama that Newsy has just lived for the last week? And featuring such and such as Keith Olbermann at the end of the credits. All right, back to Ben Smith at Semaphore. I had hoped to avoid writing about last week's big media scandal. We were scooped to Max's eternal regret. That's their media guy. By Oliver Darcy's excellent new newsletter status after we ignored a Wednesday evening email from one Anderson Jones. Jones, an anonymous sender with an Iowa IP address who has since gone dark, had a news tip. New York Magazine's Olivia Newsy had disclosed to Vox she'd had a romantic relationship with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Firstly, congrats on trying to boast your way out of how you you were scooped. All right, back to what Ben Smith wrote. But now that we are in the full fury of American media prurience and self-righteousness, I'm going to risk my neck on a slightly contrarian view. Reporters have all sorts of compromising relationships with sources. Huh? The most compromising of all, and the most common, is a reporter's fealty to someone who gives them information. That's the real coin of this realm. Huh? Sex barely rates. Come on! You won't hear many American journalists reckon with this. Some British journalists, naturally, have been texting us to ask, uh uh-oh, texts, what the fuss is about. If you're not sleeping with someone in a position of power, how are you even a journalist? The advice writer Heather Havraleski texted me Saturday that the world would be much more exciting with more newsies around, but alas, the world is inhabited by anonymously emailing moralists instead. When you're in London, check out... uh Heather Havraleski. You can find her phone number written on the walls somewhere, I suppose. I mean, would you actually write that? I, never mind. Are, you're a woman reporter. You're a woman. You're, you're a reporter. You're, you're somehow, you have no gender at all. You have no sexual organs at all. And you would write, the world would be much more exciting with more newsies around, but alas, the world is inhabited by anonymously emailing moralists instead. Leading the guy to write, how are you even a journalist if you're not sleeping with someone in a position of power? My God. Advice? And she's an advice writer. Dear Heather, the President of the United States wants to sleep with me. He'll give me a scoop and a button. (laughs) Should I do it? My, yes, you ought to, dearie. My God. Back to Ben Smith. Many of Newsy's critics were furious at her over a July 4th story about members of Joe Biden's inner circle who felt he was too old to run for president. How, these critics asked now, could she have done that story fairly if she had an emotional attachment to a fringe candidate? 
And this is where two values of journalism part ways. The obvious defense of that story is that it was true, something few Democrats now contest, though the few that do continue to loudly fill up our email inboxes and Twitter mentions. Okay, uh, if you got bribed to write a story or you offered to write a story in exchange for something from the person who benefited from the story, you're not a journalist anymore. This is just occurring to Ben Smith, who was a media columnist for a national newspaper until he started this piece of shit semaphore. But we're also in the business of trust as well as truth. Who's this we, Ben? You're not in the business. That's not what we do. I mean, you have to draw the line somewhere, and that line is taking off your pants in front of a source. And for those purposes, the appearance of conflict is, in fact, bad enough. It undermines reasonable people's trust, and there's no real defense for that. And so, before I have to hand over my editor's badge, I should mention, he's almost saved it now, hasn't he? I should mention, don't worry, he won't. I should mention that our policy here at Semaphore is that if you're having a romantic relationship with a subject of your coverage, for the love of God, tell your editor. That's right there on the wall under employees must wash hands. Especially if you're having a romantic relationship with the subject of your coverage. In other words, it's fine to F the F in Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Literally or merely via electronic and digital. The word used was digital. I'm just not going to touch that, as it were. It's fine to do that, but if you haven't told your editor about it, if you need to screw somebody to get the story, we can give you a bonus. Or at least a condom. For the love of God, tell your editor. Well, well, Ben Smith, congrats on destroying any possible credibility Semaphore might ever achieve. I mean, now I have to wonder who they effed to get the rights to use that typeface on their letters and, and their, their website. I wonder who effed them to bury that story that, that you'll never see in Semaphore. You're done, Ben. Fold. Fold the organization. If you own stock in this, if they sell stock, I have no idea. Sell the stock. This is madness. To defend the idea that reporters, and not only that, but to insist that reporters constantly do this. Madness. You will be surprised to find out that when he co-founded Semaphore, Four, I mentioned this, it was with the national paper. Guess which one? Ben was with the New York Times. Now we understand why everything's gone to hell in a handbasket in the New York Times. Either everybody there is sleeping with somebody in the Trump campaign, or everybody there isn't sleeping with somebody in the Trump campaign, or everybody in there was sleeping with somebody in the Trump campaign, and they reported it to their editor, who said, well, you can't do that anymore, and now they're all frustrated. Now to leaven this, I will have three postscripts. One, I will say one thing I realized today about my relationship with Olivia. I only realized it when I found myself writing it online. The phrase by Felicia from the movie Fridays. I've used it in sports casts and newscasts. I've used it on this podcast. Olivia taught me that phrase. Man, let's break into the New York Post's feed and put that out there. And then this from the Twitter account. At what 46 has done, the Biden accomplishments. This is so funny, I think she would laugh at it. Quote, the more I learn about Olivia Newsy, the more I think that maybe her animosity towards Joe Biden was because he didn't want to date her. <laughs> oh, my God, do I feel seen. But best of all. That New York Post gossip story Monday about my extremely peripheral role in this saga, this satirical series, I bought the actual physical newspaper of the New York Post yesterday, just on a hunch, thinking, I wonder how this looks in the print. First time in like 10 years I spent any money on the New York Post. And there, in the latest roundup of the Newsy News, was a small but glowing red box with white letters on it and their gossip logo. Page six on one half of the glowing red box and then on the other side, it read in big bold letters, quote, 
She also dated Olbermann. It's the funniest thing I have ever seen in my life. If you heard minutes of unending laughter, wafting out over the land, reaching the Pacific around 1.15 p.m. Eastern until about 1.30 Eastern, that was me outside a store that actually still sells newspapers on 2nd Avenue in New York. She also dated Alderman, white on red. Not only is it now my background on my Twitter page, not only am I getting it framed, I'm thinking of getting it as a tattoo and on my memorial marker whenever the time comes. Anyway, back to the point. Ben, sleeping with my sources? That's ridiculous. Why do you think I got into this business? Smith, today's worst person in the world! I mentioned recently that one of the things I wanted to do, in fact, my original career goal in broadcasting was to become play-by-play announcer of the New York Yankees. The second one, and the one I actually tried to work on for a while, was to become play-by-play announcer of the New York Rangers hockey team. My high school, Hackley, had a hockey team and a radio station. Not that anybody listened to us, and we had a sports director. His name was Chris Berman, and he did the basketball games and one day put out an ad for somebody to do the hockey games. And the requirement was, do you own your own cassette tape recorder? And I played you the tapes of what I sounded like long before my voice even began to change. The play-by-play wasn't bad for a 13-year-old kid. And I have to say, the next year, 1973, when the Pittsburgh Penguins job opened for play-by-play radio guy, I had the nuts to actually send them a tape and say, look, I know my voice is a little high, but think of the novelty aspect. So I always wanted to do hockey play-by-play. And then I went to Cornell, which might as well have had a professional hockey franchise. And that's still true. Lina Rink is one of the great sporting event locales in the world, certainly in college hockey. And it always sold out, and the team was competitive, and number one in the Ivy League, and a national championship contender, and the rights to the games were owned by Cornell, and immediately, of course, dispersed to the two radio stations Cornell University, Inc. owned. So we never got close to doing play-by-play of Cornell hockey. I once asked my friend, who was the general manager of those stations, Don Martin, who I've talked about here before, as one of the most important people I ever met in broadcasting. I asked him, could we do the JV games? Could we do the women's games? No, because you'll get advertising for it. I know you'll do a good job. You'll be taking bread out of the food of my announcers. And I was like, yeah, but I'm asking for like one slice of bread. (laughs) You're going to go far, but not in Ithaca. So anyway, one day... A fellow named Al Goldstein, who had come to us, I believe, from Berkeley, California, and was 28 years old and long past college days or college radio days, moved to Ithaca, New York, to try to become a radio sportscaster, newscaster, radio salesman, and had heard, had done research on this, and had determined that WVBR, the student-owned professional radio station at Cornell University, was the best training ground for radio in the country. Al was known as Weird Al, and long before Yankovic, and he was a delightful guy, and he used all the Southern or Northern California lingo that none of us understood. Happening and gnarly and all these other things, long before they became famous things. I was like, what did Al just say? I'm not sure. Well, whatever, he works hard. So he did sportscast and he did newscast and he became a salesman because we sold advertising on the radio station. And one day he came to me and he said, you know, K.O., I've been talking to uh, you know, a lot of my, my clients out there and, and they, I just mentioned the Ithaca stars and they, their eyes light up like, why aren't they on the radio? I mean, like, I know it's not Cornell hockey, man, but they, you know, Cornell hockey gets 4,000 people, Ithaca stars get... 1,800 people. It's a lot of people. People want to hear. Why don't we do the games? I get it sponsored immediately. And I went, say that part again. And he went through it again. And I said, why don't we? 
So we all knew the president of the Ithaca Stars. He was, I believe, a car salesman. His name was Bob Toddy. We called him up and said, how much for the rights to broadcast your games? We do it on an experimental basis. And he went, first one's free. And I said, I think my colleagues here will agree to that. And sure enough, we scheduled a broadcast of the Ithaca Stars versus somebody. The Ithaca Stars would be made up of Cornell graduates who did not make it in professional hockey or had played professional hockey and lived in the area, came back to Ithaca. In other words, if you were a Cornell hockey star in 1972 and did not make a career of it, you could become an Ithaca Stars star in 1978, which is when we are in the history of semi-pro hockey in this country. And they did. They drew 2,000 a, a, a game at liner rink. They almost often, when it would be a team like the Montreal former Canadians, they would fill the place out. People like their hockey in Ithaca, New York. The ice is already there. The rink is fantastic. So we put Al out on this and was like, oh, we'll try it and I'll do the games. And the program director, Glenn Cornelius, he'll be the... He'll be my color man, and and uh, we'll have somebody host in between periods, and we'll have a reporter, and we'll you know maybe we'll get some wireless. But Al came back in 24 hours and said sold it out. I was like, what? You know, I figured out how many availabilities we'd have and how many spots, and we we, we have a waiting list. We've already taken in like twenty thousand dollars for this. I went, are you out of your mind? He goes, no, man, let's go ahead. Don't tell Toddy this; he'll be demanding money. But I bet if we do, you know, we could do ten games before the end of their season. And I was like, let's go. So we now begin to promote this thing on WVBR. Coming up on Saturday night, and Glenn Cornelius and I go to a Cornell hockey practice, and we do a practice broadcast of a game, and we're like, this isn't bad. And I'm thinking, maybe I could still become a hockey play-by-play man. And my voice is changing. Maybe I can send the tape to the Pittsburgh Penguins again. So now, this is Monday or Tuesday, and then the broadcast is coming up on Saturday, and we went wall to wall. Every commercial break on WVBR, every newscast, every sportscast, every disc jockey show, even the public affairs broadcasts. In the breaks, it was, don't forget to listen to the Ithaca Stars. They're premiering on WVBR with Keith Olbermann and Glenn Cornelius. And and we had five announcers, and we literally rented wireless mics, and we had this whole thing. We had a scoreboard show planned in a studio. It was just, it was... It was network-level excess. On Friday afternoon, I walked into the radio station, and Al Goldstein was sitting at the desk in the newsroom that I usually used, in my chair, in front of my typewriter. went, ashen. And Al had what would have been politely referred to as a ruddy complexion, and he was white as a sheet. And I said, what's wrong? He goes, let's go inside, man. Let's go inside. And we went into a studio, and he went, they canceled the game. I went, what? Our game, our game tomorrow night, it's canceled. I said, what do you mean it's canceled? The, 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 apparently there's a, they forgot to, they forgot to rent the rink. I said, what do you mean they forgot to rent the rink? The Ithaca Stars have been in business for 20 years. Suddenly he forgets to rent, rent the rink. Yeah, there's a JV women's hockey practice and they won't interrupt it. They won't change it. There's no game Saturday, man. I, I, can't remember the rest of that day i do know from having gone and listened to the tape that at some point i decided that there was a very simple solution to this that more than likely my old friend don martin from whcu amnfm ithaca had prevailed upon bob toddy the general manager of the ithaca stars to not have any game that would be broadcast on wvbr And the mention, by the way, when we called Bob Toddy and did the 1978 equivalent of WTF on his backside, he said, uh, I've also rethought the whole idea. We're we're not going to do any more games on radio. I said, well, you haven't done any goddamn games on radio because you just forgot to rent the rink. What kind of business are you in? Do you sell cars that don't have wheels? I hung up on him. I was just the same then when I was 20 years old. In fact, I was still 19. I'm very proud of that. In any event, we solved this one pretty clearly. I went on the air that night and I said, we have breaking news from the world of semi-pro hockey. It's sad news, particularly in light of the fact that we were intending to bring you the Ithaca Stars game tomorrow night here on WVBR, as you may have heard in the 3,000 advertisements we do for today. We have bad news. The Ithaca Stars have gone bankrupt. Don't mess with the 19-year-old Lillerman. Thank you very much. As
As a postscript, by the way, I wasn't lying about the Ithaca Stars. I was just premature. The Stars did not go out of business during that 1978-79 season, but after the 1979-80 season, adios. Don't F with the Jesus. I've done all the damage I can do here. Ask the Ithaca Stars. Thanks for listening. We're now back to five episodes a week, posting nightly just after midnight Eastern. Once again, there is a Monday countdown. Please forward this to a non-listener who should fix that and start listening. The credits, Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel, the musical directors of Countdown, have arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Chanel handled out orchestration and keyboards, and Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums. It was produced by TKO Brothers. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by the best baseball stadium organist ever, Nancy Faust. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Other music arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed, and my announcer today was my friend Kenny Maine, who never played for the Ithaca Stars, although he was a quarterback in college. Everything else was, as always, pretty much my fault. That's Countdown for today, five weeks and six days. Until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,359th day since convicted felon drooling J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the election, use the mental health system, use presidential immunity if we have to, to keep him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news requires. Until then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and once again, the Can Keith Hit the Post Challenge. Uh, good luck. Uh, what? Yes! The return of the sausages.